to Hawaii. We're going to be going on quite a voyage today all over Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. In fact, we've assembled three first-rate teams to help us explore this magnificent place. First, Team Red. Their mission is to unearth the amazing geologic story of the volcano and maybe see an eruption along the way. Next, Team Green. They'll journey through the forest to find incredible plants and animals. And finally, Team Yellow, our culture team. They'll explore the fascinating living Hawaiian culture and have a little fun along the way. So now that you can identify our three teams, biology, geology, and culture, let's get this electronic field trip started. Today for our live electronic field trip eruption and island rising from the sea. We have a great show planned for you today, and we really, really want you to be involved in that show. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. First, you can participate in all of our demonstrations that we do throughout the show, and you can especially participate in our Your Turn activity. We're going to be doing a hula, so we really want you to try and follow along with that and get involved. Another way that you can participate is by calling in any of the questions that you have during your show by just calling the number that's on the bottom of your screen. Um, we are all the way out here in the middle of Hawaii, in the middle of nowhere, and so we have to use satellite phones in order to communicate with all of you guys back on the mainland. So we are going to be, um, there might be a little bit of a delay with some of the phone calls because we're really far out here, but we just wanted to thank Iridium for providing those satellite phones um, for us so that we can communicate to you. Another way that you can get involved is by posting your questions online at our discussion forum. Just go to the website that is on your screen, and we have a panel of experts that is ready and waiting to answer all of your questions. So, now that you know how to get involved, let's take a quick one-minute tour of the park, guided by the park superintendent, so you guys get a better idea of where exactly we're at and what it's like.
Aloha. I am the superintendent of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Cindy Orlando. I bet you can guess why most visitors come to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Yes, they come to see lava and an active volcano. And today, they're in luck. The Pu'o'o eruption of Kilauea Volcano has been active for over 23 years. And today, it is constantly spilling hot lava into the ocean. If you want to avoid the heat, you can do that, too. A dramatic view of cooled lava can be seen as you drive around Chain of Craters Road. And then for a totally different experience, the volcano protects the Hawaii Volcano National Park rainforest. Most importantly, remember that Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is a sacred place for Native Hawaiians and their culture. You may see ceremonies paying tribute to Madame Pele, goddess of the volcano. Wow, there's so much to do here. But I have to thank all of you very much for helping us to take care of this special place. There's so much to learn in our national parks. I hope you'll come back again on your own and explore. See you soon. check in with all of our teams that are at various locations throughout the park. Let's start with our geology team, Team Red. Hello, Team Red. Where are you guys at, and what will you be discovering today? Hi, JR. I'm Don, and I'm a geologist at the Volcano Observatory. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Mark. Today we're going to be exploring the geology of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Now, on your screen, you are now seeing the 1959 Kilauea eruption. We're standing at Kilauea Iki Crater, the same place that that eruption occurred. And to the right of us is the actual place where the lava came spilling out onto the ground. So, Mark, can you tell me more about this amazing crater? Sure, Megan. You see that ring all around the crater? Yeah. It's called the bathtub ring. When the lava lake in this crater reached 400 feet, it cooled around the crater and then receded some. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Red Team. I'm really excited to learn about all of that stuff. Next, let's go to our Green Team and see what they're discovering and what they're learning today. Hello, Green Team. Hi, JR. I'm Thane. I'm a wildlife biologist with USGS. Hi, I'm Beautiful. And hi, I'm Matilio. We're here on the Kilauea Iki Overlook. And today, we'll be talking about the plants and animals of Hawaii. We'll also be talking about how the plants and animals got to the island and how they managed to survive on the island. Back to you, JR. Thanks, Green Team. That sounds really interesting, too. Now let's check in with our Yellow Team. Hello, Yellow Team. What are you guys going to be discovering today, and where are you at? Hello, my kako. Makana, I am Mako, Makuluo Kilue, Iki. I am Hello, Ana Mako, I am Iki, Hawaii, and I am Hula, and I am Hawaii. Hi, I am Ali, and what Makana said was, we're in the Kilue Iki Crater. Our team will be talking about Pele culture, chance, and a hula. Well, Makana and Ali, that sounds very exciting. Aloha. I'm Andrea. And I'm Kupono, and we're park rangers at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Yellow Team. That sounds really interesting, too. You're probably wondering, where am I? Well, I am in Nahuku Lava Tube. And to explain that a little bit better, let's go to Don with the Red Team. Don? Okay, JR. Uh, yeah, as you said, you are in a lava tube. Lava was flowing past right where you're standing about 550 years ago. Uh, lava tubes form when the crust on a uh, stream of lava uh, cools, just like ice forms on a moving river. And once that crust has formed and completely goes across the river of lava, then you have a lava tube. Lava tubes uh, can last for many weeks and are very important features of Hawaiian uh, lava flows. Back to you, JR. Well, thanks, Don, for that excellent explanation. Let's continue.
Hello, I think it's great. You guys probably might be wondering what was the channel about. It was about Pele coming to Hawaii to look for him to stay. Pele is a fire goddess who came from Kahiki to Hawaii. Hey, Ali, tell us more about Pele. Where did she first land? Pele first, Momokana, first, Pele landed in the island of Kauai. She was chased by her sister, Namaka Okahai, to all the Hawaiian islands, and now she actually lives right here where we're standing. That's right, Ali. Pele is everything volcanic. She is Kilauea Volcano. The chants tell us she is the sister of Namaka Okahai, as well as Hi'iaka, and they come from a very, very large family. Because we're in the home of Pele, we have to remember to be respectful here as well. Kupono, what else do the chants say? Well, the chants tell us all kinds of things, life lessons, biology lessons, geology lessons, everything you can think of. They're very integral to our culture. The chant of Pele moving down the island chain describes the geologic age of the Hawaiian volcanoes. Maybe the Red Team could tell us more about this. Red Team? Can you help us out? Yeah, I think I can. Uh, it turns out that scientists have found evidence for a number of the stories that are told by the Pele chants. For example, the lava tube that JR is in this morning was formed by, uh, during an eruption 550 years ago that is described by the chants. Uh, also, the uh, caldera at the summit of Kilauea that we'll be getting into later in the show that dropped the summit down is described, and so are the very powerful explosive eruptions that have come out of uh, Kilauea. Now, Megan, uh, let's go on to how the volcano was formed. What about the hot spot? Now, according to scientists, the Hawaiian Islands were formed from the hot spot. The hot spot is located in the middle of the Pacific Plate. So, Mark, can you tell us what a hot spot is? Sure, Megan. A hot spot is a stationary pool of magma that is below the Earth's surface. Sometimes magma seeps up through cracks in the Earth's crust, creating islands just like Hawaii. Hey, Dad. Even though the plate moves, the hot spot stays put. This means that islands will continue to form until the source of the magma is depleted. Hey guys, did you know that Hawaii is getting bigger and bigger? This is from the lava creating new land. So Mark, is, are there any new volcanoes forming? Yeah, Megan, there actually is one forming up the south coast of Hawaii. It's called Loihi. Loihi means long, just like Loa. This island is completely underwater. This volcano is completely underwater, but it will become an island in thousands of years. It's, it is growing bigger and bigger, and when it breaks the surface, we'll probably look just like the island we're standing on today. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Red Team. That sounds really cool and interesting. Next, we're going to answer some of your questions that you have phoned in. Our first caller on the line is Serena from New York. Serena, what's your question? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that question. Can you go ahead and repeat your question? I'm really sorry, I can't quite understand your question. But the question was, how do recent earthquakes affect the lava flow? So let's go to the red team to answer that question. Mark, do you think you can answer that for us? Yes, I can. Earthquakes do affect it somewhat, but because the Kilauea eruption is a continuous lava flow, it really doesn't, it really doesn't create new eruptions. So back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Mark. That was a great explanation. Our next question is Lena from Florida. Lena, what's your question? I'm sorry, Elena, could you please repeat your question? So the question was, are there any special holidays that Hawaiians have that are related to volcanoes? And I actually think that our yellow team would answer that for us. Andrea, do you think you could answer that for us? I think I can try. Um, no, we don't really have any special holidays that celebrate the volcano. Um, we respect Pele, uh, and every time we come to the caldera, we go ahead and, and uh, honor her by visiting her crater. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Andrea, for that wonderful explanation. Next, we have Alina from New York on the line. Alina, what's your question? <laughs> So 
the question is, why can only Kapunas teach hula? Allie, from the yellow team, do you think you could answer that question for us? Well, Lena, a Kapuna is a respected elder. A Kuma Hula is a, is a hula teacher that has had years of practice with hula dancing and chanting. After years, she becomes a hula teacher. Back to you, JR. Wow, Allie, thanks for answering that question. What a great question. Our next question is from Sunny from Texas. Sunny, what's your question? Sunny, what's your question? So Sunny was wondering, when, was, when did Diamond Head become extinct? And I think maybe Don from our red team could answer that question for us. Don? I'll try, JR. Uh, Diamond Head uh, was just a, a, it's a feature on the island of Oahu outside Honolulu. Uh, it was uh, active for uh, just a very brief time, a few uh, tens of thousands of years ago, and then it stopped. So, and it's very unlikely to uh, erupt again. JR? Thank you, Don. That was great. And thank you all at home for being so patient with us while we um, are dealing with the delay with the phone calls. We will get your questions answered, I promise. Next, we have Alexa from Florida. Alexa, what's your question? Alexa was wondering, what's the, lava, the longest lava flow in the park? And I think maybe our red team can answer that. Megan, do you think you know? So, Dad, can you help me with that question? Yeah, I think I can. The longest lava flow came, uh, it started um, in the, right up here, just above where we are, and it's the very lava flow that uh, JR is in, the, is in the tube for. And that lava flow traveled about 20 miles or so before it reached the ocean. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Don. What a great explanation. Next, we're going to ask Sean from Virginia what his question is. Sean, what's your question? Sean was wondering, what is the smoke that is behind Dawn? Now, our red team could probably answer that. Mark, do you, can you explain what that smoke-looking like thing is behind Dawn? Yes, I can. It's not actually smoke. It's steam. When groundwater seeps in and gets into the heated language chamber, it comes out as steam. Sometimes the pressure can build up and have an explosive eruption. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Red Team. What a great explanation. Now, we're going to go back to the Red Team because I understand they're standing by to tell us a little bit more about vo basic volcano vocabulary. So let's check in with the Red Team. We're going to talk about some basic terms, so you know what you're talking about during the show. We're going to start with Pohoi Hoi and Ah Ah. Right now, we're standing on Pohoi Hoi, and back here is Ah Ah. Pohoi Hoi and Ah Ah are the two kinds of lava that... Uh, erupted in Hawaii. The two flows that we're standing on now were erupted in 1974. Pohoihoi is a smooth, easy to walk on lava. On the other hand, ah ah is really rough, sharp, and pointy. It's really hard to walk on. These Hawaiian words, pohoihoi and ah ah, are used all over the world, not just here. Now, we went to another part of the park to talk about explosive and non-explosive eruptions. Let's go to that. So here we are, and see all these little vol volcanic rocks and these huge boulders? This came from the Kilauea eruption in 1924. So, Don, what was here before 1924? Well, before the 1924 explosion, there was, was bare lava flow here, much like what we've already seen. We know that explosions like happened in 1924 occur at Kilauea every few hundred years. Wow. And, and so that makes uh, Kilauea quite an explosive volcano. Now, Mark, what's the difference between an explosive and a non-explosive eruption? Well, the difference between them is non-explosive eruptions have a low silica content, which means that they're thinner. The gases can escape easily, and it's pretty much just lava flow. Now, explosive eruptions, most of the time, have high silica content, and the gases can't escape as easily as they can with non-explosive eruptions, so pressure builds up and shoots out like we see here. But in this case, groundwater seeped in through the cracks, and it got into the magma chamber, got heated up, and the pressure from the steam shot all of this out. Now, I understand that JR has a demonstration, so we'll go to her. Thanks, 
Red Team for all that great information about eruptions. Now we're going to do a little demonstration of what we've just learned. All you need to do is for this um, demonstration, all you need to have is a bottle of soda. And we're actually going to take a look at what the kids did earlier this week. They did this experiment and they had a great time doing it. We actually did it outside, which is probably the best idea because it gets a little sticky. There's Atilio letting the um, explosive action happen with the bottle of soda. They had a really good time doing it, as you can see, putting some muscle into that shaking. Now, as you can see, what you have to do for this experiment is shake your soda. And if you're doing this in your classroom, um, just put a little muscle into it. And if you can't do it in your classroom, go ahead and do it when you get home or maybe at recess, if your teachers will let you. And try and do it outside so you don't get everything so messy. So I'm shaking and shaking and shaking. And then I'm just going to let it all out. <laughs> Really good simulation of an explosive eruption. So now let's go to Don so he can tell us a little bit more about what I just did. Don? Okay, JR. Uh, yeah, what you were doing when you were shaking up the can was you were uh, increasing the uh, gas pressure within the can. And uh, the, the same thing happens in a magma body or a magma chamber beneath a volcano. As gases uh, uh, expand, they create more pressure on the surface of the volcano, which is like the, the, the uh, top of your uh, soda bottle. And then uh, when the pressure becomes too much, then the uh, rock is broken and the material explodes out, or you took the, you artificially uh, decrease the pressure by taking the lid off of the uh, soda bottle. And uh, then the material gushes out. And so all explosions are caused by the pressuring uh, of gases underground that eventually overcome the ability of the rock to keep them in, and then they explode out. So back to you, JR. Thank you so much, John, for that great explanation for that demonstration. So now you're probably wondering, well, how did all of this stuff get here to Hawaii? Well, for us, we used UPS. They brought all of our materials and all of our equipment out here, and without them, we would not have been able to do the show. So thank you, UPS. Next, we're going to go to the green team, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how other things got here to the Hawaiian Islands. Green team? Thanks, JR. Wow, look at this rainforest. It looks like it's been here forever, but it really hasn't. I mean, look how big these ferns are. Also, before this was all inhabited with plants and animals, this was barren lava rock, all of it. Can you believe it? Also, the plants and animals inhabited in this rainforest were not here originally. They had to travel 2,000 miles to the most remote place on Earth, Hawaii. Beautiful. Can you tell us more about how they got to Hawaii? Yes, I can. I have an easy way of remembering this, and it's called the three Ws, wings, wind, and waves. So, Thank, can you give us some examples about this three, three things? Sure. Okay, well, let's go back to uh, the, the tree fern that uh, Atilio was uh, shaking there a moment ago. and. Uh, uh, these uh, giant ferns actually uh, originally came to Hawaii uh, brought by the winds. That's the uh, first of the three W's. And they have uh, very, very tiny microscopic spores uh, under their leaves uh, that are carried by the wind. Uh, another example of, uh, of wind is this uh, ohia tree. And uh, these uh, giant trees, this isn't a very big one, but they do get very big. Uh, were uh, brought to the islands originally from uh, far south of us, actually in uh, New Zealand and Tahiti and islands of the South Pacific, uh, born by these tiny seeds. And uh, what we'll do is we'll show you some of these seeds here and see uh, how they're blown about by the wind. So if you guys could put your hands out, I'll just drop some seeds in here. Okay. And uh, these seeds are almost like dust. They're like brown dust, and they're they're carried. Uh, the plant carries them sort of in, in capsules, uh, and uh, then when uh, when it's uh, the sun comes out and it gets dry, uh, the the seeds are, are dropped by the tree, and the, the wind picks them up. So let's make make like the trade winds here. Okay, wow. All right. Well, that that carried this. Uh, let's see the seeds kind of go towards the camera there, and uh, if the wind were blowing, they would probably blow way out over the crater. Uh, of course, we're talking now about how plants originally got to Hawaii, but realize, too, that uh, uh, that happens very infrequently. Uh, the plants that surround us here now on the rim of the crater were actually brought from uh, the forest uh, that's just a little bit uh, lower down on the slopes, existing forest here uh, in the islands. 
and uh, the same uh, uh, mechanisms that brought them here originally, uh, they use today to carry them around uh, like wind. Okay, so the second W is waves, and I've got here the uh, fruit of a uh, kala plant. This is a, a tree that grows along the coast. Now, we're way high up in the mountains here. We're at about 4,000 feet elevation, and so we can't show you any examples of plants that were brought by uh, the waves because uh, they're all down by the coast. And, of course, there's no water up here, so they can't <laughs> the waves can't bring them up this high. But uh, anyway, this is a, a hollow fruit, and maybe a beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, seed? Sure. Hawaiians used to use this as paint brushes to paint their kapa, and they also used it, the ripe ones, to make layers. Okay. All right. So that's that's waves, and then the uh, the third W is wings, and by wings we mean birds. Uh, now, it actually, it turns out that most plants that came to Hawaii were brought by birds, and uh, they came. Uh, uh, birds carried them here in two different ways. Uh, one way was on the bird, and I'll I'll bring a, a plant over here so you can see that uh, is a great example of this. And uh, this is uh, this is a cute little plant. It's uh, uh, in Hawaiian, it's called Ala Wainui. Uh, it's got relatives that you can actually get uh, at uh, uh, a garden house store. Uh, Peperomia is a scientific name. And uh, they have these little uh, uh, fruits on them that carry tiny little uh, black seeds. And uh, these stick to the birds, uh, to the birds' feathers. It's kind of a, a stealth mechanism because the seeds are so small, the birds hardly see them at all. So, uh, well, we're not birds, but we're going to try and see how uh, ourselves how, how these seeds uh, stick to stick to animals and and uh, maybe um, uh, beautiful. Could you just give, give us a demonstration here of uh, make make like you're a golden plover about ready to fly off to Hawaii, okay? And then uh, show show the kids here. All right. Now, what do you see? They're small. Uh huh. Okay. The small little black seeds and try try get them off. See how sticky are they? Are they really like like glue or what? Yeah, they stick like that. Okay. Everything. Yeah, so you can you can get them off, but it's a, it's a bit of work. The seeds stick on pretty good, and uh, uh, so anyway, that's how uh, plants get uh, get to Hawaii stuck on birds. And then uh, then the last way is a is a way that's maybe a little bit more familiar to us, and uh, uh, that's uh, by fruit. And uh, so again, beautiful kind of a plant is this? I believe that's the ohelo berry. Okay. Tree. Okay, now Ohello is uh, it's a relative of the uh, blueberry or the cranberry, and uh, the uh, the fruits are actually edible. So let's let's try and eat one here. Before we do this, we should give some to Pelle because this plant is sacred to her. Okay, well let's let's uh, give one to Pelle here, and uh, make an offering, and then let's try to eat one. Okay, back to you, green uh, red team. Thanks, guys. Here we are at the September 8, 1982 lava flow. As you can see here, there's nothing really here. So, Don, what are we looking at? Well, that's the point. There is nothing really here because this is what we're looking at. is very similar to the way the island first looked when lava first came out on the surface. There would have been no, no vegetation or anything. And it took a long, long time then to make the island. Um, Mark, how many uh, volcanoes are there on the island? There are five. They were undersea volcanoes. And the lava flows just kept building up and building up. And then when they finally broke the surface, actually waves crashed them down again. So then it built up and then they crashed down again. So it was kind of a, one, a two steps forward, one step back. And then when it finally broke the surface, uh, the waves couldn't do anything anymore. All right, Megan, how, much, how long did it take to form these? To form the volcanoes, it took about like a couple hundred thousand years. But to form this whole island, it took about like a million years. Now all the plants and all the animals that came here landed on all this. So back to you guys. Well, thanks, uh, Red Team. We talked a little bit about the uh, kinds of plants that are around here and how they got here. So let's uh, spend a minute talking about the kinds of animals we have here. Okay, Atilio, uh, uh, tell us what kind of animals we got here. Well, actually, I think first birds arrived here on the island, and that goes along with our three, w three W's lesson, wings. They use their wings to fly here. That's right. So now let's take a moment now and listen to the birds around us. Okay, 
well, let's see, guys. What kind of birds do we hear? And I know, I know we hear a whirly bird, a helicopter, but besides that, there's some other birds, too. I hear the apapane bird. What's an apapane? It's a Hawaiian honeycreeper bird, and it's actually one of the 54 species of honeycreeper birds. It is a great example of adaptive radiation. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of kinds of birds. Um, but, uh, Hawaii must have been a uh, bird paradise back in the old days. So beautiful. Can you tell us maybe how come there are so many kinds of birds and why they're so abundant? Well, other animals like reptiles and mammals couldn't get to the island, so the birds actually obviously had the place to themselves. Okay, well, that's right. And uh, birds were so common uh, that they were just all over the place, and uh, they didn't really have other kinds of animals to compete with, so they had to compete uh, with themselves. And uh, over time, different species evolved, and uh, the uh, they tended to uh, specialize. Specialized, specialization is a great way to compete. And uh, they uh, developed different kinds of uh, beaks to exploit different kinds of foods uh, in their environment. And uh, so, uh, Atelier, tell us where the apapane fit in this uh, adaptive radiation. Sure. Well, the apapane started off with like a finch-like beak, really short and stubby, but it turned into a long beak that could what, that was used for sucking the nectar out of nectar flowers. And, but what happened? Why did it, why are these birds so rare now, beautiful? Well, this used to be a, whole, a bird paradise, but what happened was people brought in predators such as cats, mongoose, and rats. They also brought in caged birds, which carried a disease called bird malaria. There used to be birds from the mountains to the seas, but what happened was when mosquitoes were introduced, they wiped out the population from the coastline to a certain elevation, and now you can only find native birds up here in the mountains. And that's why national parks like this one are so important to these native birds, because they protect their beautiful habitat. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Green Team, for that great information about birds. Next, we're going to answer some more of your questions, and please be patient with us as we deal with the delay. So our first caller is Joseph from Pennsylvania. Joseph, what's your question? Oh, I'm sorry, Joseph from Minnesota. What's your question? So Joseph is wondering what kind of insects are in Hawaii. I think we could go back to our green team that could tell us a little bit about those different types of um, insects. Thane, do you think you could help us out with that? Sure. Yeah, I think probably the most interesting way to answer that question is to say, well, what kinds of insects aren't in Hawaii? And uh, there are a lot of kinds of insects, because Hawaii is so far from uh, continents, there are uh, uh, many kinds of insects that never actually made it out here. Well, for instance, we originally we didn't have ants, we didn't have mosquitoes, certain kinds of flies. And uh, only a few kinds of insects actually got out here. So uh, the kinds of things that we have are we have uh, a couple kinds of butterflies. Uh, we have lots and lots of kinds of crickets. That's a big adaptive radiation. Uh, it's a group of uh, flies called fruit flies. Again, a big adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation played an important part here in the, with the insect life in Hawaii. Thanks, Dane, for that great explanation. Um, we can't necessarily, you guys can't necessarily hear the questions on air, but I can hear them, and I'm going to get them to you so that you um, get to know. Next, we have Mariah from New York on the line. Mariah, what's your question? Mariah is wondering, what is Hawaii's state motto? And I think we could go to Ab for that question. Ab, do you think you could help us out with that? Hi, JR. Um, I'll try. <laughs> which means the life of the land is preserved in righteousness. Back to you, JR. Thank you so much, Ab. That was wonderful. Our next caller is Caitlin from South Dakota. Caitlin, what's your question? Caitlin was wondering how many years there are between eruptions. And I think that Don on our red team could help us with that answer. Don? I'll try to, JR. Um, the number of years between eruptions is, is very uh, unpredictable and irregular. Sometimes it can only be a few months, and other times in Hawaii you can go as long as several decades. But you're really not, probably not going to go more than a century or so without having some kind of eruption. JR? Wow, thanks, Don. That's great. Our next caller is Joey from New York. Joey's wondering, 
what the climate is like here in Hawaii. And I think that we could go to our green team for that. Zane, do you think you could um, tell us what the climate's like there? Okay, well, actually, Hawaii has one of the most pleasant climates uh, anywhere in the world. It's, uh, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot of trade winds, and that's the kind of uh, winds that are blowing today. And uh, they, bring, uh, they bring the rains to the mountains. Right. Uh, back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Zane, for that great explanation. Next, we have Rebecca from Indiana on the line. And her question is, is Hawaii part of the United States? Um, I think maybe our yellow team could answer that for us. Um, Makana, can you answer that for us? Of course I can. And of course, Hawaii is the 50th state in the United States. Back to you, JR. <laughs> Thanks, Makana. Melvin from Texas is on the line. Melvin's wondering who made up the hula, men or, w or women? Yellow team, do you think that you can answer that question for us? Repeat that question, JR. Um, she was wondering whether, uh, whether men or women made up the hula. I think Ali can answer that question. Um, I'm not sure, but you can post your question online, and we have field experts that can answer it for you. I think I might be able to answer that as well. Traditionally, the male did the hula, um, but in the modern times, both men and women did the hula. And we'll see that later in the program. Back to you, JR. Thank you so much, Yellow Team. Next, we're going to be actually going back to the Yellow Team, who's going to tell us a little bit about kahili and birds. Yellow Team? Thanks, JR. Hey, Ali, is that a kahili, and what's it used for? Yes, this is a Maybe you guys can try it to make it in your classroom. Okay, so Haley is made out of native bird feathers and is used as a symbol of royalty. Uh, what, are, what, are Kahili, what is a Kahili used, um, Diploma? Well, a Kahili is used any time uh, an Ali'i is around. The Ali'i are the chiefs and the royalty of Hawaii, and it's a symbol of their Ali'i status and that we must respect them. So, to have these out, sometimes there would be a very small one or there might be a very large one, and essentially that just tells people like a badge or a crown, it's a symbol of status. What were the colors of the Ali'i, Makana? Well, the colors of the Ali'i were red, black, and yellow. Red, black, and yellow. And Some of these yellow feathers are extremely hard to find. You'll see birds that are all black with just little yellow feathers on their shoulders. Those would be the ones that would be collected. It would take lots and lots of birds to create one kahili. How would they catch those birds, Andrea? Well, there was an expert named the Kia Manu, and he would go into the forest um, and use proper protocol when going about doing that. Um, it was like that sticky paw the fame showed earlier in the green team section. So the Kia Manu would lift this pole up into the, the tree line, and the birds would land on these sticky pods. Then, <clears throat> then uh, the, when the bird was attached to that pod, the Kiamana would bring the stick down, he would take the feathers he needed, and release the bird scoop on Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Yellow Team, for telling us a little bit about the Hawaiian culture. Another part of Hawaiian culture and tradition is the hula. And this is a, your turn activity, so we really want you guys to participate th in this in your classrooms. What you can do is take off your shoes and socks and sit down on the floor and actually Ab and Kapuna Dambly are going to meet us in a hula. Aloha mai kako. Welcome and this is your turn. So what we'd like to do t um, today when, while we're here at Kilauea, we will do a hula, a hula noho for Pele, the goddess of the volcano. And this is Kapuna Dambly and she will explain a little bit about the hula for you. Aloha and greetings from Hawaii. We are so happy to be here today. We welcome you to see our children dance the noho hula or a sit-down hula called Kilauea, which was composed by my grand aunt, Alice Namake Lua. Please feel free to dance along with us. Thank you, Kapuna. Um, as part of the hula, well, what hula dancers need to do is that they need to introduce the hula that we're going to be doing. And it's called the kahea. The kahea sim simply means to call. And usually what we do is that we give the first line of the hula that we're doing. And I think the word should be up on your screen. Um, the kahea, the opening kahea is going to be, I akaluna o kilauea, 
Can everybody repeat, please? I, I, Akaluna Okirawea. My kai, my kai means very good. So, um, I'll give the, the opening beat, and then we will begin our hula. You can watch Kupuna Dambly and and follow along with us. Mahalo. Mark cow cow. Mark cow cow. Akaluna Akaluna Okila Uea. Thank you so much for showing us that beautiful hula. Now we're going to take a couple more of your phone calls. We have Tucker from Pennsylvania on the line. I'm sorry, we have actually Renee from Missouri on the line. Renee, what's your question? Renee, can you repeat your question? Renee was wondering how many years it takes for plants and animals to grow back. So let's go to the green team to answer that question. Green team, do you think you can handle that? Sure. Uh, where we're standing uh, was uh, barren rock about 200 years ago because of the big explosion of eruption in the crater. And uh, the plants uh, uh, arrived here uh, by wind and by, by wing and uh, uh, grew up. In, in about 200 years. Uh, back to you, JR. Thanks, Green Team. That's a great explanation. Now let's go to the Red Team, who's going to tell us a little bit about Crater versus, versus Caldera and what that means. Here we are at Halemaumau Crater, and thank you for the hula, guys. It was a great job. Actually, a lot of traditional ceremonies are held right here in front of this crater. Now, Don. What's the difference between a caldera and a crater? Well, you know, I think Megan can answer that. Mm -hmm. a caldera, the difference between a caldera and a crater is that a crater is less than a mile wide. A caldera is more than a mile wide. Now, we're, as you can see here, we're in a caldera, which is five miles wide. And this crater is half a mile wide. You can't really see back here, so I'm going to describe it to you. It's just like what we saw before, a lot of rocky terrain. And there's some sulfur on the ground, which is like a mineral. There, in some places, there are some lava flows, and there's actually a couple of sand vents. The cliffs here are pretty steep, too. JR, you have a great uh, demonstration of how cold air is in craters form. So back to you, JR. And thank you. Um, for this demonstration, what you're going to need is some flour and a balloon. 
balloon, and actually there's a whole list of the materials that you're going to need for this on your website. Some people have a little bit more sophisticated one, like I do, but you can do it with a balloon and some flour and maybe a bicycle pump too. And actually, the kids did this earlier this week as well. So let's take a look at um, what they discovered while they did the demonstration. As you can see here, they're pouring the flour into the box, and right now that's actually um, the simulation of a caldera being formed. Now they're trying it again, they're smoothing out the flour and making sure that the balloon is completely covered. And voila, there again, there's another simulation of the caldera being formed. So now I'm going to go through this with you. What I did is I just attached my bicycle pump to the side of my little um, contraption here, and I am going to go ahead and pump it up. And as you can see, the balloon is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the flower is kind of cracking around that, and the balloon's kind of supposed to be like the magma in the volcano. So what I'm going to do is just cover this up a little bit more, and then what happens after that is covered, I just let the air out, and it keeps going down and down and down. And as you can see, there's a little caldera forming here as the air exits the balloon. So actually, Don can maybe explain the simulation a little bit better. Don, can you do that for me? I'll give it a try, JR. Um, what was happening here is when you were pumping up the balloon, it's like more magma. More and more magma is coming into a summit, uh, into a, uh, a summit magma body or magma chamber that's a couple miles below the surface of the summit. Away. More and more magma is getting in there, getting in there, the ground surface is rising, and then suddenly lava or magma leaves that magma chamber, just like when you let the air out of the balloon. The ma magma leaves the uh, summit uh, chamber, and the ground surface drops down probably very, quite quickly to form these big uh, depressions called calderas. Now, where does the magma go? That's the big question. The magma in is injected into the volcano. It may erupt uh, somewhere else in the volcano, or it may, or it may be stored underneath. But that's the way that collapsed calderas and collapsed craters form. Back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Don, for explaining that. That was a great explanation. So next, we're actually going to go to the yellow team, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Pele and the craters. Thanks, JR. Pele lives in Hali Ma'u Ma'u Crater. Here, Hawaiians go to honor her. Isn't that right, Andrea? That's right, Ali. Um, it is at Halemaumau where Pele lives, and we do honor her there greatly every time we come to the summit area. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Kilauea Volcano is Pele. Everything here embodies her. The steam behind the red team, that is the breath of Pele. How do they honor her, Makana? Well, Ali, they honor her with a traditional local wedding offering. Kapona, tell us more about the offering of her hoku. This is similar to something you might see out at Halemaumau Crater. This is a pu'olo, and uh, there's a lot of different things that might be wrapped inside of here. The important thing is that you're giving your best. A lot of folks will go and offer a song or a chant to Pele, but the important thing to remember is that you always give your best. JR? Thank you so much, Yellow Team. What great information. Um, next, we're going to answer a little bit more of your questions. And remember, there's going to be a little bit of a delay, and you might not be able to hear the question, but I can, so I'll make sure that um, we get that out there to you. We have Abby from Indiana on the line. Abby, what's your question? Abby is wondering, what is the biggest eruption ever recorded? And I think Don from our red team can probably answer that. Don? Uh, JR, the biggest eruption that's ever been recorded was probably one at uh, Tambora, a volcano in Indonesia, a few hundred years ago. But that was just on the uh, fringe of, of modern communications and understanding. Uh, probably the, the largest eruption that has taken place when we've had really good instrumentation and, and good reporting was at Krakatau in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, that's also in uh, Indonesia. But an eruption in the Philippines just uh, 10 or 15 years ago at, at Mount Pinatubo was also very, very large. Back to you, JR. Thank you so much, Don, for that great answer to that great question. Now we have Caleb from Maine. On, Caleb, sorry. Caleb from Maine on the line. Caleb, what's your question? Caleb is wondering, is there carbon dioxide? dioxide in the volcano and again I think our red team could probably answer that 
best. Mark, do you think you know the answer to that? Yes, I do. There is some carbon dioxide, but there's also other gases like sulfur dioxide. Back to you, JR. Thanks, Mark, for that great explanation. Next, we have Rachel from Indiana on the line. Rachel, what's your question? Rachel's wondering how hot is the lava? And again, I think Megan from our red team could probably answer that. Megan, do you know? Yeah. The lava is 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Back to you, JR. Wow, that is really hot. I don't want to get close to that. Next, we're actually going to go back to the red team, who's going to tell us a little bit about the current eruptions. Red team? Thanks for those questions, viewers. So, Mark, is Kilauea erupting today? Yes, it is, Megan. It's erupting as we speak. It has been continuously since 1983. This is the largest eruption in over 500 years. So, Don, can you tell us if this eruption is dangerous? Yeah, I can, Mark. Um, it depends on how careful you are around the eruption. The eruption itself is not uh, dangerous, uh, and you can get it with care uh, right up to see the uh, lava flows quite, quite closely. But if you're foolish and you do things that you shouldn't do, then, of course, you can get in trouble, as with anything. For example, if you were to uh, go where you're not supposed to go and get up to where the lava is coming out of the ground, then you could have sudden collapses of the ground, you could have explosions, small explosions taking place, and so forth. Also, uh, if you um, get too close to the lava, if you walk on it, or you really aren't very careful, you can get badly burned by the uh, lava. And unfortunately, a couple of people whom I know have uh, been badly burned on their legs during this process. So um, by itself, the eruption isn't dangerous, but it can become so. Um, Megan? Wow, you guys, this island is amazing. We took a long hike to a to the current eruption and saw the lava flowing into the ocean. It was amazing to see Pele at work. Why don't we take a look at that clip? Alright, here we are right in front of the most current eruption. We had to walk two miles over all this rocky terrain. As you can see behind us, there's a bright orange hot lava flowing into the ocean. It's causing the ocean to steam. That lava got there from way over there on, that on the top of that mountain. It flowed seven miles through lava tubes, and now it's emptying into the ocean. The, er the eruption has been going on for 20 years. It has created this rocky terrain. Well, this is really fun coming out here. Like I said, we had to walk two miles to get to this, and it's the experience of a lifetime. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, this is an amazing eruption. Yeah, it's I know. the lava emptying into the and even though we had to hike two miles, it was definitely worth it. Yeah. My legs are a little too. Yeah. So. Well, there you have it. Well done. Can you tell us more about Kilauea eruption? Hi. Uh, uh, something to try, Megan. Um, as she said, this is the largest eruption that we've had at Kilauea in a very long time, at least 500 years. Um, much of the lava has been supplied through lava tubes, just like the one that JR is, is in. Uh, the lava tubes insulate the lava, keep it from cooling, and that's what allows the lava to travel so far. So this lava, uh, much of it now is moving about uh, nine miles or so from Pu'u'o'o, its vent, down to the ocean where it's going in the ocean, and that's where uh, Megan and Mark saw the uh, lava the other night. But there are also surface lava flows that occur, and uh, that's what you can see if you go out there at the, at the right time. You can actually see lava uh, moving uh, on the surface. Now, this eruption uh, is the uh, longest uh, re in recorded history for Kilauea. Uh, the uh, previous uh, eruption lasted about four and a half years, and that was in 1969 to 1974. Um, okay, uh, back to JR. Thanks, guys, for showing that, us that great um, current eruption. That was really cool. We have a couple more callers on the line. We have Carolyn from Michigan, and she's wondering what kind of fish are found here in Hawaii. Atilio, do you think maybe you could take a stab at that question? JR, can you repeat the question, please? The question is, what kind of fish are found here in Hawaii? Hmm. I'm not quite sure. Thing, do you know? See, I'm having a little trouble hearing the question. Is that what kind of fish? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, we have um, many hundreds of species of fish uh, that are found on our coral reefs here, everything from sharks to butterfly fish. Uh, so you'll, uh, you'll just have to come here and see them. Uh, back to you. Thanks so much, Dane. Um, our next caller is Carson from Indiana, and he's wondering, um, how does magna form? Mark, do you think you know that question? I do. You know how inside the earth there's the mantle? Well, above that, there's some solid rock. When, when, the man, when the solid rock touches the mantle, it melts. That when that melted rock seeps up through the, when that, melt, not, that rock melts, it's called magma. When it seeps up through the surface and comes out as a volcano, as an eruption, it's called lava. Back to you. Thanks so much, Mark, for that great explanation. Now, we're sort of getting towards the end of our show, but let's just do one more check-in with all of our teams and find out what's the coolest thing that they discovered while they were here in Hawaii. Green team, let's start with Atilio. Atilio, can you tell me the one cool thing that you learned while you were here in Hawaii? Yes, thanks, Jr. The most interesting thing I learned was adaptive radiation, just <laughs> how unique these birds are, and they're only here in Hawaii. I just love that. How about you, beautiful? Actually, the thing that I liked the most was the three W's and how I learned about how the birds got here and lived on their own. So back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Green Team. Thanks for sharing. Now let's check in with our yellow team. Makana, can you tell us the one favorite thing that you discovered while you were here? Well, what I discovered was the kahili and its representative colors and how Pele can take many forms. <laughs> how about you, Ali? I learned that all about the culture in Hawaii and how important Pele is to the Hawaiians. Back and back to you, to you JR. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Ali and Makana. Now let's check in with our red team. Megan and Mark, what was the most favorite thing that you um, learned this week? The favorite thing that I learned was that generally Kilauea is a non-explosive volcano, but it has had explosive eruptions. Back, back to you, JR. Thanks so much, Megan, for sharing. We had a great show today, and we'd just like to thank our sponsors for helping us. Um, Iridium for providing the satellite phones, the UPS Foundation for getting all of our materials out here. We'd also like to thank the National Park Service, the National Park Foundation, and especially Best Buy Children's Foundation and Ball State University. Without them, this wouldn't be possible, and we wouldn't be able to do these great shows for you. So um, I also wanted to announce that our scramble winner um, is the Tory School um, from Texas. So congratulations, guys. Thanks so much for watching, and see you next time. Ooh, hola.